I'm Dennis Anderson, and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. From the law bench to philanthropy, we hear from a former St. Louis County judge of nearly two decades on his career move to a community foundation focusing on philanthropy. Plus, we'll highlight a public appeal to the legislature to pass nearly $3 million in funding, citing severe rain and other climate change impacts. And in this week's Voices of the Region, an update regarding efforts by some to rename a route to Wisconsin. These stories and more coming up on Almanac North. Hello once again and welcome to Almanac North. Thank you very much for watching. I'm Dennis Anderson. Julie is off this week as we alternate hosting during the pandemic. Well, this week, the Duluth branch of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People called on the Duluth Police Department to release biannual reports on their use of force and arrest rates. The local branch also wants the Duluth PD to eliminate changes in practices they may be implementing. As Enbridge's Line 3 oil pipeline construction nears the halfway point now, the question of whether the pipeline is needed was under discussion in court this week. Minnesota Court of Appeal judges heard arguments regarding long-term demand of the pipeline's oil. The court has 90 days to make a decision. St. Louis County's Public Health and Human Service Department sent letters to school districts across the county last week. The purpose was to point out an uptick in youth COVID cases and update districts on new testing recommendations for students. The county saw an increase in cases in youth ages 5 through 19, with some linked to participation in sports and social gatherings. The county is concerned some parents may be intentionally avoiding getting their child tested. Meanwhile, the College of St. Scholastica is planning for an in-person semester come fall. Recommendations for a safe return are being developed by a Scholastica planning task force. The Northland Salvation Army Red Kettle campaign raised nearly $150,000 this past holiday season. Miners Incorporated contributed an additional $50,000 March is Minnesota Food Share Month, and the Salvation Army encourages donations to the largest food drive in the state. Well, our first guest now served St. Louis County as a judge for nearly two decades, and now he's turning a page in a new career. Three months ago, he took over as the executive director of the Duluth Superior Community Foundation. The foundation promotes private giving for the public good in the Northland. Sean Florkey is joining us to share why philanthropy is more important than ever now that we are all living in pandemic times together. Sean, welcome. Thank you very much for being here. Yeah, you had a career here. change. You moved from the bench uh, to philanthropic work. Why the change? The board asked me the same thing. They said, why would you come work for us? And I told them a story I heard 17 years ago. It was Don Coyas, who's a Mohican elder, shared it. It's three sisters come to the river. I bet you've heard this before, Denny. First sister, the babies are drowning in the water. First sister jumps in and starts saving kids but isn't making any progress. Second sister thinks I can teach them to swim. They'll be able to help. Still not making enough progress. They look at the third sister and they say, why aren't you in? How can you stand there? And instead she turned and ran away. And you know where she was running. She was running upstream to figure out who was putting babies in the water in the first place. Yeah, great story. And I story. said to him, I'll do third sister with you. That's Can we change our community in a way that, that kids are safe and whole and have every opportunity and every chance to do everything you and I have done in our lives? Mm -hmm. So how does the foundation fit into that? So we, we have the privilege of connecting donors with mission around giving into the community. We have 440 different funds that we give money into. You wouldn't believe the things <laughs> I keep bumping into. So we're, we're sharing money into the community. It's, it's private giving for the public good. Um, it's people who share and share and share to mm -hmm. make a difference. Prior to taking this position, did you have any real idea no. as to the fullness of the no. foundation? I what still it don't. I'm still <laughs> learning, man. Um, no, I had no idea. The scope, we're in 10 counties. We, 
we have work going on in so many different spheres. And the conversations have been just fantastic. People giving, yeah. people receiving, people who receive then give as well. Um, kind of a generous community. It's not that one person brings everything and one person receives. It's that we all bring, we all receive, we all share together, you know. Is there a new vision you bring to the foundation? I don't, I don't know that it's new vision. Um, I, it's a beautiful place with a bunch of people who are doing really good work. Um, I might be louder and wilder, so we'll see. But they, they want to keep doing good work in the community to change the community. Sean, talk to us about the generosity of the people who live here. Um, we, got a, we got a check couple of weeks ago from a couple who said, um, and it was part of the COVID campaign, but they, they had gotten their stimulus check and they said, we don't need this. Give it to somebody. Isn't that nice? Yeah. So we took that, we put it into uh, COVID-19 fund. We've given away $645,000 in the last year to help with COVID relief, um, working with other partners. People are generous, yeah. generous, generous. Wow, that's really good to it's, hear. It's really something. Yeah. Who are the first ladies of the hillside? Tell us about <laughs> that. <laughs> that's, that's part of the story. There's, there's, we've helped a little bit with some work at, at Steve O'Neill, and they are folks who are, who are getting on their feet, getting connected. They're, they're moms who are raising their kids in a beautiful way, and now they're reaching out and helping other folk. It's that generous community. It's, mm -hmm. They need some help. We're helping, and now they're reaching out and helping, too. Is philanthropy, Sean, more important now than ever before, maybe during times like this when we live in a pandemic? That'll be known forever by the, the gen next generation or two of people. I, absolutely. And, and, and philanthropy in partnership with everybody else. It, you know, we're talking with the city, county, school district, other, other partners. How do we all come to the table? And you know that about Duluth. It's this beautiful place where people come to the table. How do we come to the table and all work together in a way to, to help folks and help it, better, help it be a better community for our kids? Mm -hmm. Do you have a long range plan yourself or a goal you want to reach in the next say, five years with the foundation? We want to, we want to focus on, on changing those outcomes for kids and that's a big big deal so five years is probably short term but how do we how do we figure out the one two three four five things that we need to do upstream in our community with other partners to really shift those outcomes yes yeah. right? how did your work as a judge help make this transition i mean you you, you obviously yeah. were, were working with with parents and kids yeah. from time to time uh, on the bench. Yeah, and I, and I studied kind of the human condition and, and the way that we kind of come together and try and help people. And now I'm translating it and trying to, trying to go into community building, not just courtrooms and people's and individual lives, but bigger and broader. Yeah. yeah. Two terms, equality and justice. Yeah. How do those terms fit into what you're doing now? COVID has absolutely shown wide the gaps in our community. Some folks are hit and hit and hit and hit. And the same folks who have had a hard time finding equality, finding justice, finding open doors. Um, so it'll be, it'll be the lead in what we do. Mm -hmm. A lot of the COVID relief is about building communities that are healthier and healthier. It's not just about yeah. um, helping somebody out of that scrape. It's about how do we, again, how do we change yeah. the outcomes? Can you share a little bit, Sean, about the million dollars in grants that have been given during the COVID period? They've gone to lots of different, um, mostly we're granting to nonprofit folk who are then helping other folks. They've gone to, um, one of them was Steve O'Neill. There, no, there was no internet capability there, so we helped him get a little bit of internet through Molly Harney and mm -hmm. uh, the First Ladies. Can you imagine? I had a court hearing where the family was sitting in a car because they were outside the school getting Wi-Fi because that was the only way in. So even that ability to, to get internet access, you can't survive COVID in our culture without internet access. So, the world has changed. Yeah, and just being able to make a real difference for a bunch of people right there. How has the pandemic then influenced the foundation's work? I think what we're doing and what everybody's doing, again, back to Duluth being a, a generous community is we're partnering and partnering and partnering. So, you know, I'm talking with 
Tony at Northland Foundation, I'm talking with Don Ness at Ordeen, talk to Joan at Lloyd K. Um, everybody's talking and trying to figure out what are you doing, how do we help, what can we do together, what are we missing, are we overlapping? Um, there's this collaborative spirit that I think is just so inspiring. So it sounds like you are working well with the other foundations. In yeah, I'm trying to catch up. Oh, I'm right. the new kid. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they, they're, they're all at the table. The, the, uh, E3 out on the west side, everybody's at the table trying to figure out how to help and how to fit and then how to transition out of the immediate needs of the yeah. pandemic into, well, what do we need next? Citywide broadband, things like that. How do we, yeah. how do we improve going forward? Which, which brings the question, has the foundation learned anything from the pandemic? Well, you, you learn that people are still generous. Giving continued. People continue to give and care, even when the whole world looks like it's tumped upside down. Um, so generosity, and then we've all learned that the needs are just writ large. Yeah. Writ large. And certainly the needs were there, were they not long before the pandemic? Yeah, yeah, hit? yeah. We see it better now. I think as a culture and community, we see it better now. Through and you talk glasses. to your neighbors who haven't been able to pay rent because they couldn't work, and what's that going to look like? So there's a there's a lot of anxiety out there. Do you think there'd be any changes to the foundation in post, uh, post pandemic times? Well, there has to be, right? We have to learn. So the answer is yes. What that looks like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But if you're not a learning organization, then you, then you don't survive. Your immediate goal? The immediate goal for me is to learn and learn and learn. But what, but, but what I'm really, what, the thing I'm focusing on is having those conversations. So, so we're working together. We're not in a yeah. little silo and you're doing your thing on how do we work together in a way that, that meets the needs. Sure. Sean, it's been a pleasure. Oh, it's good to see you. Good to see you Talk again. About thanks travel for, thanks for being here. What the world will look like <laughs> when it go. gets on its Sean feet. Sean Forkey, CEO, yeah. President, Duluth Area Community Foundation. Mm. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, thanks for having Goodbye. me, Danny. time now for Voices of the Region. Each week we hear from a journalist in our broadcast area and the stories they are reporting. This week, Danielle Kading from the Superior Bureau of Wisconsin Public Radio is our guest. Moccasin Mike Road. Um, is actually named after someone who is an, a non-native um, and replaced the uh, Osagi Trail, basically, that was running along there at the time. Um, and so this effort um, is something to jumpstart a conversation about renaming the road to recognize the history of the families that grew up there. Um, and, you know, they had some conversation from one of the descendants of... Um, or one of the families of the descendants of Chief Joseph Osagi. Um, and, and that was um, Mary Stone McConnell. Her husband is a descendant, a direct descendant. And, you know, this is something that they want to see move forward um, and part of recognition of kind of the mistreatment of Native Americans over the years and efforts to, you know, address that and move forward in a positive way. Um, it apparently has received some backlash. Counselor Jenny Van Sickle said that when she introduced this proposal, she was surprised by the amount of, um, quote, raw racism that came about um, after it. But, you know, the family says they support her in this effort and that they're glad to be part of the conversation and, and talked with because they feel like they're usually left out when decisions are made about Wisconsin Point. Unfortunately, we've lost more than 65, almost, I think, 6,600 people now in Wisconsin. And Native Americans in Wisconsin are dying at the highest rate from COVID-19. 
And unfortunately, you know, Joe Martin Rose passed away um, in late February um, due to complications from the virus. You know, he was a tribal elder who had a significant impact on community members within the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa and really beyond, you know, um, some of the people that talked about him, you know, talked about how he was always passing on that knowledge and really an encyclopedia of the history of the Anishinaabe people and their cultural practices and keeping that alive and revitalizing their culture and language. And, you know, Bad River Tribal Chairman Mike Wiggins said that he was always talking about the seventh fire prophecy, which kind of foretold of a time when people would be left with a choice between two paths, one that would continue the degradation and and demise of Mother Earth and another that would lead people back to harmony. And so he said that Joe really believed in that prophecy and made it his mission to protect and preserve natural resources. Ashland family is claiming that the school district there, the Ashland School District, discriminated against their three kids when they were forced to quarantine after one child was exposed to the COVID-19 virus. Um, Kelly Madey, whose husband and three kids are members of the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, says that the district treated her kids differently because they're Native American. Um, This happened in early February when her 12-year-old son had to stay home after being exposed to the COVID-19 virus. Um, And the district said that because her son was exposed, that her two youngest kids, who are five and nine, also needed to be quarantined. And they were placed in an isolation room for 45 minutes until she could pick them up from school. Um, So now she has obtained an attorney And a letter was sent to the district outlining multiple instances where she says other students have tested positive for the virus and their siblings or their teammates were not quarantined. And Midday and her attorney say, you know, they fully support safety protocols, but that isn't the core issue here. They're concerned that the district's COVID policy or practices aren't being applied equally to all students. So now they're planning to file complaints with the State Department of Public Instruction and also the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights. Um, You know, the Ashland School Superintendent, Eric Olson, has said to Madej that her children were not treated any differently from other students. He claims that every student, along with their siblings, have been subject to quarantine if that student was identified as a close contact of someone who was tested positive for COVID-19. Ashland County has a referendum that they're gonna put before voters in the April election, where they're proposing to raise property taxes by nearly a million dollars each year for the next five years um, after reaching what county leaders have said is a fiscal crisis. You know, this is something that the county board approved in January, and now they had a meeting this week um, to kind of have a listening session about what people's thoughts are about that. Um, You know, this is something that would raise property taxes on the average home worth about $100,000. I think it would go up about $87 per year. So they discussed this on Tuesday this week. And some of the things that came up are, well, you know, Ashland County is set to get about a million and a half dollars in COVID relief money um, coming up this year. So could that money be used to help with the county's budget issues? And the the county administrator, Clark Schroeder, said, no, Unfortunately, you know, that money is slated for the COVID-19 emergency, so it can only go to things like aid to small businesses, aid to impacted tourism industries or travel or hospitality or households. So there's some restrictions on that money that can't be used to help fill the gap in the county's budget or to address their budget woes. So they still need to go forward with the referendum.
The Minnesota Chamber of Commerce has released a report on the economic benefit that immigrants bring to the state of Minnesota. The Chamber Foundation report says immigrants here are an undeniable benefit to the state's economy. The Chamber says as Minnesota's population ages and the native-born workforce participation rate drops, foreign-born workers fill gaps in, in employment. Uh, the Chamber emphasized the positive contributions immigrants make to our economy. The report also says there will be career opportunities for the native-born population as well as immigrants for the foreseeable future. You can visit the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce's website for the full findings of the report released this week. The Minnesota Pollution Control Agency is leading an effort to combat extreme weather they say has been intensified by climate change. The MPCA is asking the legislature now to appropriate seed money to prepare the state's infrastructure for wet weather. Heavy rains that flooded portions of Duluth back in 2012 were among the events cited in a virtual news conference on Wednesday. The proposal put forward by the MPCA and state leaders calls for nearly $3 million in funding to begin planning for infrastructure improvements. The MPCA's commissioner joined with a state lawmaker, mayors and the insurance industry to stress the need. They say the money will help communities prepare for extreme rain events and other climate change impacts. Officials say our stormwater systems, sewers and wastewater treatment plants were not designed for the climate that we face today. They claim more wet weather and frequent extreme rain is actually overloading the current infrastructure, specifically citing an average of 150 wastewater overflows each year. They say there have been over 20 cases of partially treated wastewater being released in the northeastern region of Minnesota in the last few years. We recognize that our changing climate and increasing extreme weather presents new challenges for our towns and cities and counties. And the cost of inaction is simply too high for our communities to bear. Today in Minnesota, we are seeing trends uh, and three major trends across the state due to climate change. First, Minnesota is becoming warmer. Second, our state is becoming wetter as demonstrated as today. Uh, and third, we're experiencing more frequent and more intense extreme precipitation events uh, or mega rains. In fact, these mega rain events are now four times more likely than they were just a generation ago. And in the last 10 years, we've seen mega rains in communities, including Wilmer, Brainerd, and Duluth. Extreme storms are a risk to public safety. They damage public infrastructure and they can have devastating effects and result in costly cleanups for families, homes, and businesses. Unfortunately, Minnesota's communities are increasingly unprepared for these challenges. In particular, our water infrastructure, including our stormwater systems, sewers, and wastewater treatment plants are aging and becoming obsolete. Thank you to everybody for the opportunity to speak to why addressing climate and water and water infrastructure is paramount to the sustainability of communities. The high water table of Lake Superior is we believe related to climate and what we are seeing is record high levels in 2019. It was the highest that the water table had been since 1940. So that is like 80 years <laughs> of data that's been collected and the impacts of what we see. It's not just on the singular business. It's not just on a singular uh, resident. It is on neighborhoods. It is on communities. It is costly. Ever since I've grown up, scientists have been telling us. Um, I remember in elementary school in the 80s hearing um, that we needed to take action on climate change, that climate change was happening and it was going to be a crisis and we needed to start acting. And it's been decades. I'm in my 40s now and we put a lot of this work off um, for most of my life. So, um, you know, what we're what we're looking at is truly an existential crisis that as many people have said, um, is truly intersectional. It's going to affect every area of our lives, our economy, 
our health, um, our the natural environment, obviously. Um, but it, it will be something that affects all areas of our life. And it is something that we should have been planning for. So I just want to lend my support for this very modest proposal for planning. I mean, this is the exactly the kind of thing that we should have been doing probably about 20 years ago, but um, we need to do it immediately. It needs to be done with urgency now. And um, I'm very glad to see that, that we're moving in this direction. Let's do this and let, let's do more of this. The proposed $2.9 million would leverage other funding and help communities prepare for extreme weather. Grants would be provided to assess risks and vulnerability, as well as to develop plans for stormwater and wastewater infrastructure projects. Keep up with the latest from Almanac North by following us on our social media. You'll find us on Facebook and Twitter. You can also visit the WDSC website for the latest program updates, news about the station, and our upcoming events. And download the PBS video app for on-demand viewing of your favorite programs. Thanks to our guests and the crew here in the studio, I'm Dennis Anderson. Stay healthy, everyone, and be kind.